Well, howdy duty once again. As you may recall, this is the second reading from a chapter from Prairie Earth by William Least Heat Moon. This chapter's about a little town called Bazaar, and Least Heat Moon is visiting uh, an 80 year old lady who used to be the postmaster in this small town. And we left off last time where she'd taken him in to the room in her house which was which had been the old post office. Blanche remembers hearing old ranchers tell about the earliest post office here, which was a mound on the east side of town where lay rocks inscribed with family names. Anyone returning from the nearest town that had a post office, Emporia, left neighbours' letters under the appropriate stone. Beneath her counter is a small box of glass shards from the site, which lies a few miles west of the plane crash that killed Notre Dame coach Knut Rockne in 1931. And there's also a glass bottle which has turned to opalescence and embossed with the words wonderful eight once containing who knows what elixir of wonderful healing and this little bottle Blanche dug from her vegetable garden in the backyard near the old cyclone cave which she refuses to enter preferring to take shelter in the 91st psalm thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day just beyond this storm cellar near the tracks lies the path to the depot which she walked ten thousand mornings at six to wait for the doodle bug the one car train carrying only mail passengers and cream on the crossing at the corner of her yard, two years after Rockney crashed, Postmaster John Mitchell died, lugging his laundry over the tracks when he stepped in front of an engine one January night. But, she wonders, how do you accidentally walk into a whistling locomotive? They found the frozen body the next morning, his wife was an ignorant woman. His wife was an ignorant woman, they say. Smoked a corncob pipe. And John hid away his education. In his toolbox, he kept a cardboard tube. And in there were, were his postal commission and other paper and another paper. One afternoon... When a federal inspector examined Mitchell's certification, he saw a rolled up diploma with John's name on it, and in surprise, and, and in surprise he asked why a Yale graduate would be in this godforsaken place. And Mitchell grabbed the papers and threw them back among the tools and said, Forget it. Neighbours suspect a link between that sheepskin and John's death on the tracks. But the only explanation now has to be what you invent. Blanche says, Martha Leonard came here with her husband and two sons in 1857 from Pennsylvania. And she died the next year the first white death recorded in the county. But they say she named the town after her shop back east, where she sold fancy work in infant's clothes. Later, a postmaster changed the, the town name to Mary, but it didn't stick. She says, Bazaar began up on the old trail 
a half mile west where our last schoolhouse is, up next to the cemetery. The first stone school was up there too, one room. It was the heart and we were the blood of bazaar. They did everything in the building, voting, ciphering matches, spell downs, cotillion dances, singing lessons, moon courts, moot courts, magic lantern shows, literary societies. She doesn't say it, but I've heard about the old Utile Dulce Society that met there. On one occasion, the Dulce was an interpretation of Hiawatha's wooing, and on another, the Ute Utile was a demonstration of a sausage grinder. They held church in the room and Grange meetings. The schoolhouse record book states that the building was to be open for anything from a political meeting to a monkey show. Sometimes, probably, about the same thing. Funerals too. The teacher would gather the children in the back of the room during the service and later they'd see the coffin carried out the door and across the schoolyard to the cemetery. She is pausing now and watching the misted morning press on the window panes and the day seeming not to have enough light in it to give to the room. And she says with vigour, So, what did we do with that rock schoolhouse? We tore it down. We left only one step. But they didn't get our last building when they consolidated the district, we kept it for a community centre. They didn't get it. And I'm thinking how the highway department did get the massive triple arch bridge over the South Fork a mile east, amongst the finest stone spans in the Middle West, largely because of one non-resident's complaints. The country bosses, the county bosses, refused to let its beauty and history stand alongside of the new bridge. Blanche says, The railroad was built here in 1885 to reach the pastures, then stopped. We were the end of things and boomed up to 75 people. Then, in 1923, the tracks were laid on through, and soon we were on the main line. But it wasn't enough, especially when trucks started hauling the cattle. That was about it. So, what remains is the inertia of existence. Blanche Swilling's will not to let go, and the few women of the village who continue collecting rags and gathering to tear them up to make rugs to sell at their annual benefit called the Bazaar Bazaar. I ask to see the upstairs and she lets me lead. One room piled and the doorway labelled disaster area and pasted to the wall is a newspaper clipping about Zubilon Pike passing nearby uh, that was an early explorer. Uh, and another with a photograph of Blanche in a tiara when she was the centennial queen of the courthouse. A second room for her diaries, which she has kept for 70 years, and her hobby collections. I've labelled them from A to Z. N is napkins. H is handkerchiefs. P is my favourite, my potpourri of prayers. I ask what Z is, and she says, zip code cancellations. And her bedroom, under the roof slope ceiling, the walls close, tidy, sparse, only a chair and steel bed with a white coverlet 
over the little concavity in the mattress where she sleeps in the fetal position. A string from the pull chain on the naked bulb in the ceiling to the bedstead and an old mirror with the silver mostly gone as if its reflections had worn it through. We are again in the middle room. When Carrie Chandler lived down here, she jumped when she had a chance to move to Cottonwood. And someone asked, But you'll be buried in Bazaar, won't you? And she said, I've been buried there long enough. It's a story I've heard several times because it so encapsulates for the citizens the challenge of living in the old hamlet. Blanche, as she has for the last couple of hours, sporadically taps her small right shoe on the floor as if counting time. And she says, I could never be buried here long enough unless I missed the resurrection. And she speaks of her two years teaching school on Osage Hill, where she, where she taught as many as five students. And the greeting cards she sells, although she ends up using most of them herself, of her late hours tatting in front of Johnny Carson, of how she'll doze off in the aluminium chase until 2 a.m. She rises from her chair and crosses the dim room, puts on her hearing aid as if to listen for the mist against the windows or for some ethereal footfall upon the porch. Beautiful stuff, isn't it? It's in the mid they're in the middle of what's perceived as nowhere. And this beautiful little old lady with a wealth of stories and a very rich life. I admire this writer for having the time and patience to discover such people and to to allow them to tell their truth and, and what touches them and what's important to them. It may not sound like much. Never been on TV. Never been in a movie. But they've lived very rich lives and they've contributed to their, communi their family, their community and to the country. Little towns like this are really at the heart of the United States in really any country. I guess we think of the cities are the main thing. But all these places were built by damn hard work. Anyway, I'm banging on and uh, it's probably not what you want to hear. So, that was good fun. There's, I think, a couple more readings in this book. Uh, the really good stuff's pretty thin on the ground, although it is a damn good read, and I would certainly recommend um, getting these books from the library or a second-hand bookshop or even buying them. It's been a great inspiration for me, this writer, in many ways. I love you. And I'll send my love to all your family, immediate, and also your brothers and sisters, and Yoli as well. I hope you enjoy your time in Mexico. Bring me back a sugar skull or something. Where? A bottle of tequila with a skull on it. <laughs> anyway, bye for now.